Now, in the 18th century, the Grand Tour had brought the younger generation of the nobility into contact with the ruins of ancient civilization in Italy. But this had the effect, among other things, of causing them to think how far the state of the country had declined since the days of the Roman Empire, <coughs> inspiring, among other things, to the young Edward Gibbon to write his masterpiece, The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, where the Forum and the Capitol had once stood, mused <coughs> Gibbon, there were now only fragments. How and why had such a dramatic transformation, decline, of what was once the world's most powerful <coughs> empire taken place. The Grand Tour was an education not just in classics, in other words, but also in the current desolate state of the countries visited, the evanescence of empire. <coughs> the French Revolutionary Wars and the Napoleonic Wars, lasting from the early 1790s up to 1815, brought the Grand Tour to an abrupt end. And when peace was restored in 1815, it was soon replaced by the emergence of commercial tourism, catering to the newly rich middle classes and making use of technological innovations such as the steamboat and from the 1830s onwards, the railway. The impression of decay and decline since the ancient world was, if possible, however, only strengthened by the new tourism celebrated in paintings like Thomas Cole's The Course of Empire Destruction, painted in 1836. So the effect of travel was to confirm the Victorian sense of superiority over other parts of Europe. As Britain industrialized, as British trade grew and expanded, British towns and cities multiplied in size and then were cleaned up in the sanitary and hygienic revolution of the mid-century decades, as Britain's countryside was crisscrossed with railway lines and metal roads and canals, British travellers began to feel they were stepping back in time when they stepped onto continental soil. Inspired by romantic ideals of the sublime and the picturesque, they went in search of wild, natural landscapes like the Rhine Gorge and medieval ruins like the castles which adorned its heights, many of them indeed reconstructed still as ruins for the benefit of British tourists. Here's a view of the Drachenfels by a British engraver, Thomas Sutherland, painted in 1820. They often thought they found the Middle Ages alive and well and embodied in the continent's inhabitants and their strange, quaint customs. In 1846, a story in Blackwood's magazine about a group of English travellers in Belgium described how one of its members, who thought the English cathedrals were mere architectural monuments, half-deserted places for meditating on past times and the Middle Ages, found in Brussels Cathedral that those past times, as he said, have come back again. And the Middle Ages were present on the continent, not just in the form of picturesque ruins and ancient customs, but also in what the British travellers saw as the dirty, smelly, and unhygienic habitants, uh, hab habits of, uh, the, of the continentals themselves. Landing at Calais in 1835, Francis Trollope was much amused at the answer made by an old traveller to a novice making his first voyage. What a dreadful smell, said the uninitiated stranger. It is, replied the man of experience, the smell of the continent. <laughs>